It worked. All right, let's. There, I think that looks pretty good. All righty. So we're doing sugar skull makeup. Um, not many people know this about me these days, but my minor in college was theater. And so one of the things that I really enjoyed was doing stage makeup. And I'm excited because this is going to be a little bit like that. Um, and actually, for my base, I got a actual stage makeup brand. So that's fun. Um, I'm going to mute my monitor. There we go. Okay. So we have... Mayoron Makeup Clown White. I'd end up looking just like that, but we'll see. So this was also an Ask Me Anything. Um, and I opened it up for questions on Instagram. And I don't have a ton and a half of followers, so I didn't actually get like that many responses. But my friend Katrina, who is an awesome person, and an activist and just super inspiring um, asked me, is there a respectful way for white people to celebrate this holiday, which is Dia de Muertos? And I, in my opinion, think yes, um, that there is there are respectful ways for white people to celebrate Dia de Muertos. Um, and the key is uh, my sister and I talked about this a little bit in the video that we collaborated on, which is on my YouTube channel. Not trying to plug myself, but we did talk about it a little bit. Um, and so I think the idea of Dia de Muertos and celebrating the people that we love and who are no longer with us is a fairly universal concept. So if that is what your goal is, and what you're doing, in my mind, that's a respectful celebration of the holiday because that's what the holiday's about. Like, you know, is it is it weird for people of color to celebrate Christmas? No, because it's a cultural thing and they're celebrating whether it's Jesus or joy and togetherness and family or, you know, so I don't know, that's not a great comparison because the, you know, it's hard to, it, you know, people of color aren't appropriating white culture, but in my mind, if you're honoring the spirit of the holiday and using it to celebrate the lives of people that you have loved and lost, that's, that's respectful. Um, which actually brings me to an interesting point. This year, uh, witchy photography was very popular. And a lot of people went and took photos in graveyards. And to me, I was like, is that a white people thing? Like, <laughs> I, I just don't, I don't get that. So, you know, on the flip side, do my dead ancestors care if people are posing on their graves? Probably not, but I'm not sure how I feel about it. So hmm. that might be a question to ask yourself, you know. Yes, you want to be careful celebrating another culture's morning rituals. But, you know, maybe also be respectful of your own culture's morning rituals. is going on better than I thought it would. If I were a real makeup YouTuber, I'd be like, all right, well, I washed my face in unicorn tears and I moisturized with the butter of those fluffy Highland cows and I used primer and serum and all sorts of cool stuff. And I... I'm a swamp goblin, so I did none of those things. I scrubbed my face with a washcloth and plain water like two hours ago. And I'm applying stage makeup 
straight to bare skin. So that was the big question that I got from Instagram was, is there a respectful way for white people to celebrate Dia de Muertos? And my answer is yes, respect the spirit of the holiday. And I hope you do find meaning in it and catharsis and connection, honoring the people and pets. Um, and I'm going to include pets. I've got my little tiny kitty Calavera up there. Um, and I actually know a couple people this year who have been inspired to put up a friend us. Um, and I think that's really cool. And it is really respectful because they're honoring their loved ones. And that's the whole idea. Um, and one of the things that we're missing here and now because of the pandemic is the community aspect of Dia de Muertos. Like a big part of it is, you know, gathering at the grave sites and decorating the graves and all that sort of stuff. Um, and we're not able to do that. So I think it's especially important to observe in your own ways, in your own home and do it safely. Aw, Stella, good. Stella says in the comments that um, she, put, she put out coffee and cheesies on her ofrenda and lit the candles. Um, and I, I hope that helped you find some inner peace in a time when that is hard to come by. And I know it did because you told me it did, but that is my wish for all of you. All right. This is real special, y'all. Oh, this is Urban Decay Primer Potion. I bought a sample size from the checkout lane at Ulta like three years ago and I'm still using it. More evidence that I'm not a real beauty YouTuber. So you guys, um, ask me some questions. I know Adrian in, you, in our chat off of YouTube, you said you had a couple that you had shared, um, but the only one I remember is, what is a reenactorism that you could do without? Um, and I'm going to go with racism. Uh, I know that's not just reenactors, but, uh, you know, a lot of people use history as justification for their biases. And this is definitely a case of those who do not know their history or study their history are doomed to repeat it. And I think some of the growing pains that we're seeing in the U.S. right now, this is specific to the U.S. because that's where I am. And other than Canada is the only place I have reenacted. And Canada is having their own troubles uh, with regards particularly to their treatment of the First Nations. Um, my face itches. Of course it does. So the whole like vintage style, not vintage values goes double for actual like recreation of history when people were owned as property and women were property and people were genocided out of their ancestral lands. Um, and if you live in the U.S., don't at me about this, but you're living on stolen land. You were probably taught in your textbooks that the, forgive me, the Indians sold their land or agreed to move to make room for the settlers. I hate that word. I have cat hair up my nose and I can't. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, there were wars. People died. And now you live here. So at the very least shows that land some respect. So bad. I really need to powder this. I'm going to get my eyeballs done first. 
Oh, you guys missed it. Um, I did a test live stream with Robin and Sella earlier and they got to watch me put on my contacts and I forgot that all of that, that they hate the ball punching. So, oops, sorry, kids. Unintentional barfiness. Adrian's looking up her questions. Okay. That's not too bad. I'm not used to being this pale, guys. Powder. This is a sample size of some powder that I got in an Ipsy box. You guys can hear my dogs. I'm sorry. That's okay, Adrian. Um, oh, one of them was, what is a re What is something that's a reenactorism that you know is a reenactorism, but you're okay with it? Ooh, okay. Reina asks, what are good resources for historic Mexican clothing? Um, it's, it is a little bit hard to know where to start. Um, oh God, okay. So for Las Soldaderas or Adelitas, which for those who do not know, um, the Mexican Revolution was like 1910 to 1920. And so women were a huge part of the, the war effort. Um, and actually, depending on how wealthy a woman was, she might have fought alongside the men, um, particularly if she was uh, wealthy enough to own a horse and could be in the cavalry, but women who were not that wealthy also served, um, and basically filled what we would think of as a camp follower role in reenacting. Um, so they did, and actually even more so than what <laughs> camp followers a lot of times actually did. Um, they did like the cooking around camp and stuff that is a reenactorism in a lot of um, U.S. sites. Um, so they were, it, but it would, it, they enabled the, the army then to go out and fight without a lot of the other stuff that the women were doing that, you know, spending time on that. So, okay. Still a little sticky, but that'll work. Um, so, my my best tips for researching are particularly for that is to start looking up um, las adelitas or las soldaderas, and there are and I found them and I may have bookmarked them and if I did I'll try and put a link up later. But there are a couple of scholarly articles out there or like research people that people have written research papers that people have written and then published online. And those have bibliographies. So you can go in and see what sources those people used to write those papers. And that's a really good way to get started. Another nice thing is that this happened at a time when photography was fairly widespread. So it's not like a United War of 1812 stuff. Um, and so there's no photography. Uh, so that makes it a little more, more difficult. Um, by the time you get to the Mexican Revolution, it's 1910, and there were several well-established photographers um, in Mexico. So they went and took photos of all sorts of stuff, including Las Adelitas. So um, Google image search has been my friend for that. Um, and then also finding people's bibliographies and then kind of doing a deep dive that way. Um, all right, scrolling back up through comments. Yes, okay, so I answered that one. Um, Reina, it's also really gonna help if you can speak Spanish or if you can kind of wade through Google's Translate widget on uh, some of the web pages because some of the best information that I found was Fortunately or unfortunately, depending on where you stand with your language skills in Spanish. Um, but I have found that Google 
um, will translate whole web pages and it's not terrible. Um, it's obviously not going to be like a native speaker telling you in English, but it's enough to get a general idea. Um, okay. Adrian says, what was the most memorable thing someone ever asked you at a historic site, whether it's memorable in a good way or a bad way? Um, okay. So the most memorable thing from a historic site, it wasn't actually something that someone asked me. It was, um, one morning we came in to, it's, a, it was an 18th century historic site. So it was a, a trade fort that had in Northern Michigan that was originally owned and built and owned by the French, um, and then taken over by the British. That's a whole thing. But basically, we're there interpreting ho what was called habitant, habitant life. Um, and part of that interpretation was cooking. And so generally, the site supervisor would come in in the mornings early and start fires in all of the historic buildings where we were going to be doing cooking. And the this particular day was Jim's day off. Um, if by some miracle Jim Evans sees this, hi, Jim, you were a great boss. I miss you. Um, I should have blocked out my eyebrows, but I don't have a glue stick. So, oh, well. Uh, so anyway, I showed up and I'm supposed to be baking bread and there's no fire. And if you've ever baked like in a Dutch oven over an open fire or on a hearth, you need coals. So I was already behind um, and I was going to need to get a fire going as soon as possible. Well, it was also a school group day, which meant that we had several hundred like third graders um, in Michigan. Actually, I think it's fourth grade teaches Michigan history. So we got a lot of fourth grade age kids, which is like nine years old just swarming the site. And so they were already there. So I couldn't use like, this is what I use for my candles. I don't even like using matches because I break them. Okay. So I have to light a fire in a period way in a house with a bunch of little kids watching. And I'm not really sure how I'm going to do this. So I find a flint and steel and I go to the blacksmith shop and beg a, a wad of tow t-o-w which is like a fibrous flax linen like like frayed rope almost um and i head back oh and a bit of char cloth which is like charcoal but it's made with gun patches so it's cloth and so i head back to the the house and the kids are like what are you doing and i'm like well i'm gonna try and light a fire here but i'm not really sure what's gonna go and so i all right i'm gonna give it a give it a try so I start sparking my flint and steel and people keep coming in and they're like, what is she doing? And the kids are like, she's going to light her fire. So they're like hyping it up. And I turn around and there's like 30 people in this like half of a historic room. And I'm like, oh, shit. so I'm like, all right, I'm going to try it one more time. And it works. I spark the flint and steel. It catches on the char cloth. I shove the char cloth into the wad of tow and start blowing. And all of a sudden it just goes, Foosh, into this beautiful big orange flame and the like these 30 people crammed in this room actually applaud <laughs> and so I, I get it into my tinder and I, I get the fire actually going and everyone you know oh that was so cool you know I didn't know that's how they did it blah 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 and they disperse and I went <laughs> like sweating over to the blacksmith shop and I was like I need to just go home I'm not gonna be able to top that today <laughs> like that was amazing and it was the first time i had lit a fire with flint and steel so that was probably my most memorable moment working at a, uh, a historic site in a good way there's always the are you hot matt is that a real fire i did enjoy being asked are you real which in the kids defense there were mannequins at that historic site so like you'd walk into the priest's house and there was a creepy ass mannequin of a jesuit priest so they were, you know, not appreciative of getting startled by mannequin heads and mannequin bodies and mannequins that had voice recordings that were motion sensitive. So they'd start freaking talking when you walk into the building. So, you know, you see a person, you're like, are you real? Yeah, it sounds stupid, but they also probably wet their pants three houses ago. So I'm not too mad about it. 
So E Urbach says that they usually get um, kids knowing about Flint and Steel from Minecraft, which is super fun. Um, I don't think Minecraft was a thing back when I worked at historic sites because it was in like 2006 and 2007. So I'm old, but I actually really love how many, like I play Minecraft. My husband plays Minecraft. We played Minecraft together when we were dating from overseas and it's, it's a fun little game. And I like talking to, talking to people about it. So that would make my day actually. If they're like, Oh, I saw that in Minecraft. All right. Start off with some Ben Nye, which is another um, theatrical brand, and I'm just gonna starting start to shade in. And then I've got this. I went and splurged on this NYX palette so I can put some fun colors in here. So I'm excited that excited that yes, I'm excited for that. So I have a question for you guys um, and just something to think about when I on Instagram was like, would anyone be interested if I did a Calavera live stream? You know, do you think I should? I got a handful of answers that were no. And I was like, that's weird. Like, why would you care? It's not even going to be on Instagram. And I'm wondering, the like, have you ever heard of something like Dia de Murtos, like freaking people out? Is it the skull thing? Like, and, and it may be because my Instagram is started out as an American girl costume Instagram. And now it's been taken over by Latino living history, which I have something to say about that in a minute. But I was just curious. It was like, interesting response. Not what I expected. I figured if people didn't want to watch a live stream, they just wouldn't say anything. Oh, and I never answered the, um, what is something that I know is a reenactorism, but I'm okay with it. Um, Hmm. Hmm. I don't know. Hoteling at events. <laughs> <laughs> um. I've done the camping thing. I've done the cooking over the fire thing. I enjoy that. Maybe that's the reenactorism that I'm fine with. I actually don't mind cooking over a fire and I enjoy feeding people. So yes, in most military scenarios, the soldiers should be cooking, but I don't mind cooking for people. I enjoy experimenting with camp and hearth cooking and also, the schedule that they have for soldiers at a lot of these events is ridiculous. So, if you're firing a flintlock for a battle twice a day, and you have to clean it in between, and there's morning colors, and blah, 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 blah. It, it's, I would rather cook for people in my unit than have them go hungry or pass out on the battlefield or whatever, because they didn't have time to even cram down a handful of almonds. Okay. So I guess that's a reenactorism that I'm fine with. Like I enjoy feeding people. I know it's not strictly historically accurate. The events that I do it at aren't strictly historically accurate. Um, but I'm okay with it. All right. JC says my dream living history project would be a digger colony from the English Civil War period. That sounds intriguing. Rich actually did English Civil War um, back before he moved to the US. So I would not be against some sort of exploration of that time period, even though the US was 
just a widow baby starting out in the 1600s. All right. I'm going to use this yellow color because it reminds me of the marigolds that go on ofrendas. Ooh, I like that. Okay. Is this maybe a scenario where I should have done... Uh, I make up first because fallout, potentially. All right. All right, guys, we have 10 people in here. You guys need to ask me some questions. Rich is also sitting behind the camera. Do you have any questions, Rich? <laughs> Why did I marry you, you crazy person? <laughs> Does that count? You guys, he enables me so much. It's It's... Quite lovely. Yeah, fluffy brush better. Raina says that, um, I'm going to say they, think of the skull makeup as more artistic than scary, but some found it very disturbing, especially at night events. They got reactions and it probably depends on context. I would agree. It depends on context. Um, I grew up in an area where you would actually like go up to people's doors and they would have, like, they would leave their porch light on for trick-or-treaters and then have a note on their door that's like, we don't participate in the devil's holiday. So, like, Halloween stuff was frowned upon, even. And um, so I can see people being uncomfortable with it. And one of the things about this skull makeup, it's inspired by an early 20th century artwork of La Catrina, spelt with a C, which I'm saying because my name is Katrina, spelt with a K. <laughs> um, but... It was the, the elegant skull, and it was kind of the basis for this elaborate skull motif that you see for Dia de Muertos a lot of the time. And it was popularized then again in, uh, I believe, 1947 by Diego Rivera um, in a artwork of influential Mexican icons, um, including himself and Frida Kahlo. So, you know, it must be nice to have that kind of male confidence. But uh, yeah, so the idea behind it was a couple of things. So the style, was it was like an elegant skull lady wearing an Edwardian hat. And part of it was to satirize indigenous cultures that wanted to be more European. So putting on airs and dressing more European um, and kind of shunning their indigenous roots and then also the idea that death is the great equalizer so um this is obviously a well-dressed wealthy person because big hat fancy clothes but in the end we're all we're all basically we're all a skeleton piloting a meat suit so when you die your meat suit's gonna go away and all of the skeletons look the same um, I saw a funny artwork that was kind of that. It was like 10 skeletons in a row. And it was like, you know, male, female, gay, straight, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then the last one was pirate. And it was missing the bones of the bottom of one of the legs and no, and didn't have a foot. So it would be like a peg leg. Uh, I thought that was pretty funny. Um, but yeah, so death being a great equalizer um, and will eventually break down the barriers of class and race and culture and eventually the skeleton that drives the meat suit is going to be all that's left so that's kind of where this comes from i forget where i was going with this you remember richard you ever know where i'm going with things <laughs> shaking his head 
I can imagine, though, that, you know, an elaborate popping out of you, at, popping out of you in the darkness would definitely be disturbing. But popping out at you from the darkness would be equally disturbing at a nighttime event. Um, and I posted on Latina Living History Facebook, I posted a National Geographic article um, that had some stunning photos, which obviously it's Nat Geo, but um, there were some really cute ones of like little kids in skull makeup. And I thought that was really darling. Yeah, Sella, Sella shared that article too. So she's agreeing. Stunning. And obviously, you know, National Geographic is like the gold standard. But it made me smile though, because um, I've talked a little bit about one of the reasons that I'm feeling so invested in Dia de Muertos this season is because my maternal grandfather passed away over the summer. And one of the things that he collected and that there were lots of in his house were National Geographics. So having that article come up with exactly the topic that I was talking about was kind of like, hi, Grandpa. I'm sharing it for you. So that was kind of neat. And I talked about this a little bit on one of my group chats, but um, another one of the things that Rich and I are going to do kind of in his memory is to invest in some camera equipment because another one of the things that we found um, in emptying out his house, which I say emptying, <laughs> it's, it's not empty. It's not going to be empty for a while, but uh, yeah. um, one of the things that we found was that he was, he and my, my late grandma were really into photography and so there were cameras and slides and photos and a slide projector and just all sorts of stuff like that. So I think if part of his legacy were to be some pretty cool camera equipment um, that we can use, particularly now when we're all, as I like to say, indoor cats that don't get out and talk to each other very much. I, I think he'd think that was cool. And yes, JC and uh, my cousin Beck are partners and have rehomed and adopted the National Geographic collection. So it has gone to people who will truly appreciate it for its art and artistry and its family connection. And I got to say, I'm really happy about how a lot of the stuff is getting like dispersed to the grandkids because my one cousin is a professional photographer, and so he's going to take um, some of the camera equipment and stuff. And um, I called dibs on uh, some old photo albums from like the early 20th and late 19th century. If no one else, but what that was kind of a if no one else is going to take charge of them, I don't want them to get lost or destroyed or leave the family. So, um, they may not end up living with me. They may end up living with my aunt or my mom, but that's fine. Just as long as they're still in the family. Okay. So I got some eyeballs. I think I want more color on the eyeballs though. What is this? This is a medium angled shading brush. I want more color on the eyeballs or around the eyeballs. Let's do, Ooh, that's pretty. I like that. That's like a blue sparkly. Complimentary colors are cool, right? Look, Scylla, it's teal. So another one of the things that I thought was interesting to come out of my Dia de Muertos video was um, 
that I mentioned that the that Dia de Muertos is a regional celebration. And my understanding is that it is like central and southern Mexico. Um, but that means that not everyone celebrates it. And it was interesting to see in the comments that that is extremely true even today, even though the Mexican diaspora um, has very much popularized the festival. Um, and so, you know, people in the U.S. are celebrating it. But some people from Mexico are like, well, we're, we don't celebrate it because we're not from Michoacan, whatever. Um, my understanding is also that um, my dad is from southern Mexico. And so his region would still have had versions of the celebration, but they're not necessarily the super iconic versions. Um, a lot of a lot of the popularized stuff is Michoacana. That's cool. Just to know a little bit in more detail where stuff comes from and to recognize the facets that make up a different culture. You know, it's not it's not a monolith. Oh, okay. Well, actually, Reina just asked about that. Is it more regional on whether Dia de Muertos is celebrated with an ofrenda and other traditions? Um, yes. So different regions celebrate in different ways and different parts of Latin America have different traditions. So Dia de Muertos is specifically Mexico for the most part. Um, but, you know, back in pre-conquest times, they didn't have the same political boundaries that we think of. So there's also forms of the celebration in Guatemala. Um, and they have like these really awesome colorful kites uh, that are super awesome and cool. And you should look at that uh, National Geographic article. That's where I got some of that, that information. So um, different, different places in Mexico and Latin America in general have different ways of celebrating. Um, and, you know, I guess if a Mexican family or person wanted to incorporate it with Halloween, they are more than at liberty to do so. Um, so uh, my friend Samantha made soul cakes for Samhain. S A M H A I N. Um, that looked a lot like Pan de Muerto to me. So it's interesting to see the kind of similarities and differences across cultures as well. Okay. Now. The worst part of a face and makeup and also things like sleeves when you're sewing is that there are two of them and they have to look the same on either side. It's very rude. Oh, that's a, that's an old pencil sharpener. Oh, geez. That was real Midwest. Oh, geez. Okay. Oh, that's not super sharp. <laughs> My left side is so difficult. You know, the absolute best part of this is going to be is washing it all off. I'm specifically not using my waterproof products because of that. Yeah, I forgot that when I was doing theater makeup, I got to do it on other people.
we're gonna do what the experts call smudging that out, I believe, and just kind of use a fat crayon method to, and I didn't fuck it up. I remember one of the things I was going to talk about. Um, so recently on my Instagram, La Vida Josefina, I reached 500 followers, followers, subscribers as YouTube. Um, and so I'm going to do a giveaway. Um, and what I'm going to be doing is a... Not sharpening a makeup pencil, thank God. All right, so what I'm going to be doing is a necklace. Um, the Josefina American Girl doll has this distinctive garnet necklace that's part of her story. And it is also a beautiful piece of jewelry. Um, and I'm going to hopefully call on my long dormant sculpting skills because I love using clay when I was younger. Um, so I have epoxy sculpt and excitingly I have real garnets. There we go. You can see them. I put them in front of my white makeup. Um, and so I'm going to make a little I'm going to make one for me and then one to give away. Um, so I'm hoping to get that going pretty soon. I wanted to get my make my makeup, my sewing room here down in the basement set up first. Um, because if I do anything upstairs, which is where I've been doing all my sewing as I've been, um, getting my craft room in order, if I do anything upstairs, it's going to be covered in cat hair and potentially knocked off the table and all sorts of horrible things. So now that my craft room is coming together, I will have space to actually work on things with a minimum of pet interaction. Because um, one of our three cats, four cats, doesn't know that that room exists. One of them doesn't come into the basement at all. One of them hates me because I took her to the vet to get her hair cut and she still hasn't forgiven me for it. And the other one runs away when he sees me. So hopefully that means that my area there will be somewhat sacrosanct. Right. Guys, this is taking a long time. I'm very sorry, but that's okay. We're just here for funsies. That's really sharp. Okay. Major struggle. I need my black eyeliner back. All right, good enough. Okay, now, skulls out. There's a cheap one. Not perfect, but all right. Okay. 
Now we're getting somewhere. Another reason that I've kind of uh, taken an unintended hiatus from the Josefina project is that the next thing I have to do is the camisa or shirt for her Chino Poblana look. And I don't want to. I'm not good at that type of construction of garments. And I'm afraid I'm going to screw it up. So I haven't been working on it. I've been procrastinating on it by doing things like cleaning my carpets or riding my horse or literally just visiting my horse and cuddling him after letting him run around in the indoor arena. And yeah, so I've been doing almost literally anything except working on that, which means that not only do I feel guilt, I don't really have anything interesting to show for that outfit. So I'm tempted since now it is past October. We're going to be doing Christmas things before you even know it. Maybe I will just move on do her Christmas outfit and come back to the Chino Poblana outfit after that because the any sort of like photos that I would take of that would be mm, my cheekbones aren't even does anyone care um, so E. Erbach asks, am I going to be using a pattern? No, I am not, which is part of the reason that I am a bit hinky about it because I am using historic construction methods like you would use for a shift, which I have a history with of sucking at. So part of the, the drawback here is in my head. But just because I've never made a shift that I was happy with doesn't mean that this camisa is going to be the same thing. But it might be. And I was a gifted child. So what if I fail? Then my life is over. What if I get a B? Then my life is also over. So I should just not work on it until the absolute last minute. And then if I pull something out of my butt, I'll have to just go with it. Probably not the best life advice. Don't take that life advice. Are you nodding from behind the camera? Yeah. Apparently Rich and I were both gifted children. I know some of you also know this struggle. Okay. I'm going to put purple under here. Adrian, why are you poking me? You know what the worst thing about this whole like gifted child academic success thing is, is that it literally does not matter now that I'm in my 30s. No one has cared what my grades are for over 10 years. Adrian, I don't understand why I need a poke with a poke you sick because I'm talking about my gifted child mental issues. I am providing therapy for my other gifted child followers. 
thank you. My advanced degree in armchair psychology is helping people. So the way I'm making the shift in Camisa, or well, the way I'm making the Camisa, there is no difference in construction between the shift and the Camisa. Um, if you look at the doll outfit, it's made like a shirt with the round armhole um, and sleeves that fit into it. I am doing it out of square construction, partly because the fabric I'm using is very limited. I have like two and an itty bitty bit yards to work with. So I wanted to maximize the amount of fabric I used and minimize the amount wasted, which you lose usage of fabric with curves. Um, also, I'm following the workwoman's guide, um, which is available on Google Books and is very helpful. It's from the 1830s. But there's a lot of similarities in how things are constructed. Um, but in the 1820s, which is what Josefina is representing to the 1830s, so there wasn't that much of a difference. So, um, and the, the shifts that they show in there are made with the square construction as well. So I elected to do that for economic use of fabric and also potential historical accuracy um, the one difference is that the neck is going to be gathered to a curved band, which is, I don't think strictly historical because you end up, like I said, wasting fabric that way. Um, but I'm going to have to cut out a big hole for the neck anyway. So I'm going to use that circle that I cut out to cut the curved band, which was a revelation because I was like, I only have a little bit of fabric and I don't, I can't get a curved neckband out of it and I don't know what to do. And, and weeks and weeks and weeks I agonized over it. And then I realized, you dipshit, you're cutting out a giant circle. Cut out a smaller circle out of the giant circle and put it over your head like the fairies from Sleeping Beauty where they cut a hole in the fabric and you're like, that's the hole for the feet to go through, except it's your head. So, I figured that out and was like, all right, well, now I feel dumb because I agonized about it for weeks. And then I was like, well, now I feel dumb because I've never made a shift that fits. So why haven't I been working on the Josefina project? Because I feel dumb. But you know what? Pushing yourself out of your comfort zone can be good for you. It's uncomfortable. That's why it's outside the comfort zone. Otherwise, it would be in the comfort zone. So, it's like how I'm pep talking myself here. Okay, hey, I'm liking this. Still with the itching, though. That's that's still a thing. All right. I have a plethora of makeup brushes, but not enough to do actually everything I want. So. We're just gonna scrub this on a towel. Yes, okay, so Work Woman's Guide is from 1838, which is 14 years after what Josefina is representing, but we're gonna go with it. Right. Oh, she pretty, look at that, you guys. Okay, it's brighter in person. Yeah, square construction didn't change that much. I'm just bad at math. And actually, I did um, I did already tear my, not tear, I pulled threads and cut my pieces because uh, Willoughby and Rose, Kate, on uh, YouTube, put out a shift-making tutorial for CoCovid back in the summer, and it actually made a lot of sense. And she caught quite some bit of flack from a leading researcher of shifts, uh, and 
it was some bullshit because I've read that person's research before and made shits that didn't fit me. Whereas I watched Kate's video and I was like, wow, suddenly I understand what the hell is going on. So to the person who shall not be named, who gave Kate flack for coming up with similar construction by looking at originals to what you published on your website a bajillion years ago, that didn't make sense to me. And wasted a lot of linen in my life there's room for all kinds of instruction calm down please okay if she sees this she's just gonna be like a sassy millennial told me to calm down i'm sure All right, well, I have some pink left on my. So. I should have done like I did last time and only done half my face. But did I think of that? I did not. Okay. So, this. Nope, I can't do that. All right. Generally, there's like petals or something around the eyes. But I'm having a rough time with my pencils. So we're just going to do that. You know, it would have been really cool if I had gotten some like crystals or something. That would have been pretty boss. But that would have required a lot more prep than I was able to put in, thanks to the overwhelming brain fog that I have been suffering for the last several months. Which, frankly, if you are also going through that, is a completely legitimate trauma response. And we are all going through a collective national trauma at the moment. So cut yourself a little slack. I also happen to be dealing with personal trauma related to the loss of my job and my grandfather within three days of each other. But none of us, I think, are having a great time right now. So if you find yourself feeling spacey or frustrated with yourself because you can't focus or because you can't draw a good dot on your face, on your left side, or whatever, it's okay. Be gentle with yourself. My poor mom and aunt have got it worse than I do. Like, they're, I, my mom is the trustee of my grandpa's estate, and my aunt was taking care of him day in and day out for the last several years. So their lives have changed in a major way. Um, so I'm not going to say I'm glad that I lost my job, but one of the things that I have been glad about is that being unemployed has made it so I'm available. And sometimes my mom will just come over and talk and that helps her. And so I'm glad that I've been able to do that with her and for her because I would not have been able to if I were still working. Now, I'm going to do do it now. I'm 
pencil. All right, we're gonna do leaves on my chin. Time, all yes, Adrian. Time means absolutely nothing. I don't know what's going on. Who cares? Um, I did accept a conditional job offer with the post office to be a seasonal package slinger. Um, so that's cool. If you are sending stuff to Michigan, I might touch your package, provided my background check comes back all right, which it will because the last thing I am is a criminal mastermind, particularly with this brain fog. All right, guys, Rich isn't here to defend himself. So I think next time we should all vote that I do makeup on him instead of on me. He's coming back, act natural. Thank you. I heard you talk. It's not something that I say very often. Oh man, I should have done a weed leaf. I don't even do weed, but it would have been fun to horrify people. That's kind of my jam. We're just laughing. All right, so this is not going to be like a top top video on YouTube, but I'm having fun, and this isn't bad for literally having bought one palette. We're just having a good time. Kind of nice to do something with the end of the weekend. And we have an extra hour today. So after this, I'm going to go upstairs and have some wine. My animals are very discombobulated with the time change. Okay. Okay. I like it. I like it. All right. I forgot how much white makeup makes your teeth look yellow.
order that in. It's still gonna get on stuff, but at least I tried. All right, I was gonna try not to use my good eyeliner, but this is clearly not good eyeliner. What? Watch this not be good eyeliner either. Yeah. Did I use this up? You guys. Mother Mc mm -hmm. Okay, that Are we coming up now. I had a thought. Do I want waterproof eyeliner on my mouth? I'm going to go with no. Good thing the vacuum is already down here. These little pencil shavings are getting everywhere. You know, I can't even blame the lights for this pencil being soft either because we have LED lights. All right. Okay, I'm gonna put teeth on. You guys think of stuff to ask me. And then when I can talk again, I'll get to you, okay? Ready, set, go. Adrian, I see you. Yeah, you winky face me, Adrian. Yeah, you know, I know where to find you. No, don't push your lips together. All right, we got some good ones, you guys. 
Okay. So Adrian is a bit of a turd, but because I love you all. My husband is real, but we met on the internet. And at first, when I told my parents that I had met a man in England and his name was Rich Lovely, they were like, is he also a Nigerian prince? Have you taken leave of your senses? Are you the girl that I raised? What is wrong with you? So there was a moment in time when his realness was in fact in doubt. But I am happy to report that USCIS, which is Customs and Immigration Services, has verified his realness. He exists and is not scamming me. Although we joked that he married me for my money, but I married Rich. Anyway, um, my face is unfortunately real. If it were not, I would hopefully have... a less twitchy and funky looking face underneath it. Uh, this is a real candle behind me, actually. In my Dia de Muertos video, we had uh, LED candles in the cabinet here, so I didn't light anything on fire, but you couldn't see them with the lights. So this time I have real candles. Um, and yes, this is my real hair. Although I do have hair pieces that are also mine because I bought them fair and square. Uh, now for actual questions who are that are from people who are not turds like Adrian. Um, if we weren't in the middle of a pandemic, would you wear calavera makeup when going anywhere like to a Dia de Muertos party? I am not sure at this point that I would feel comfortable enough to wear it out to a, an event because I don't necessarily have the full context and the ability to explain everything that I have put into the thought process in Spanish. Um I can tell you what I'm thinking in English, like I'm exploring my culture and that sort of thing, but I, I'm not confident enough to have a conversation about it in Spanish, which is important to me because the people putting on a Dia de Muertos get together in this part of the world would be Hispanic. And I feel that it would be respectful of me to be able to converse with them in their own language about it if they wanted to. Um, and I feel it would be disrespectful of me to show up only speaking English like an ugly American. So I would love to go to a Dia de Muertos event. I know there's at least one in Grand Rapids because um, there is a fairly robust um, Spanish speaking population here. And um, I think it'd be really cool. And maybe in a few years, I'd be confident enough to do the, the skull makeup. I got to say, it also really bugs me not to be able to touch my face. So if I were going to go out for a night somewhere, I'm not sure I could do the full face of my hair. <laughs> but I would really like to go to a Dia de Muertos event. That'd be really fun. My favorite garment to make. Um, hmm. I would say... <laughs> um, I actually don't really like to sew all that much. I like wearing the finished finished garment. But um, I really like Regency dresses because they do go together pretty quickly. And I find them very, very flattering. I have so much white makeup. My pencil. My lips are twitchy. Oh, okay. Let's see. Oh, I got more questions here. Oops. Amber asked, what is my horse's name? My horse's name that we call him day to day is Duncan. He is an ex thoroughbred racehorse. So like Kentucky Derby style. He never went to the Kentucky Derby, um, but his Jackie Club name is Talking Sickum, 
which um, his family that that owned him before us, he was born and bred on their farm. Um, and they called him Sikkim, which to me sounded a lot like, you know, like, go get him, boy, Sikkim. So I, and he was so gentle that I, I didn't really gel with that. So we settled on Duncan. Um, one of the names, however, that we talked about because I'm a giant Lord of the Rings nerd was the name of the horse that in the books, Glorfindel and in the movie, Arwen rode when rescuing Frodo from the Nazgul. And that horse's name was Asphaloth, A-S-F-A-L-O-T-H. But I'm from the Midwest. So I turned to Rich and I was like, what about Asphaloth? And he goes, when you say it, it sounds like Asphaloth. So we couldn't go with that one. <laughs> so his name is Duncan. Is there something you made in your early days sewing that you want to make now that you have more experience? Um, again, with Lord of the Rings, um, I made with my mom a version of one of Eowyn's gowns, the white one that she wears when they first turn up at um, shit, what's the Edoras, when they first turn up at Edoras. Um, and I loved it, and it was basically just an empire dress with swoopy sleeves. Um, but I would like to make it in a more like medieval inspired or like, like that, like historical inspired style. I think that'd be really cool. Even though I look nothing like Eowyn on account of I would look really weird as a blonde. And also Tolkien described her as tall. He described her as slender and tall. I have at times been more slender than I am now, but I will never be tall. So maybe I can be Eowyn standing on a box. <laughs> You guys didn't see that, right? I just drooled. Okay. I like those teeth. Um, Laura V says, do you have a favorite Regency dress pattern. And I do. It is the Laughing Moon drop front dress pattern. Um, I really like that one for ease of use. Making a dress that you can get into yourself, which is uh, very convenient. Um, and it's got really nice lines. I think it's just got really pretty seam lines. And the Laughing Moon patterns are good because they include easily accessible modern construction methods, but then also historical information and bibliography. So you can kind of take whatever approach you find best for you. And I really like that. For skull makeup, because of the itch factor, I use makeup that drives for the most of my face, but grease makeup on my nose can be touched up easier when I have it. Yes, when I inevitably touch my nose. Although at this point in time, none of us are touching our noses because we're all wearing masks. So, but that's another problem is that I have a really cute cotton embroidered mask from a, a um, Latin American store around here that I really like. And because it's cotton, it gets cat hair inside it. 
and then it itches. So that's cool. Everything is cat hair. Sing that to the tune of everything is awesome, please. Somebody. Everything is cat hair. Everything is cat hair all up inside my nose. Oh my God, text. <sighs> Oops. Um, so is, is Calavera makeup something everyone who celebrates wears or just people in parades? Um, I think it's got several uses. Um, my understanding is that you see it like the, the National Geographic article that um, was shared around had pictures of like little kids wearing it. So I imagine that being in a parade was really cool. When I was little, like we had a couple of community parades that my Girl Scout troops participated in and that was fun. Um, there's also folk dance uses for it. Um, and then it again comes from an artwork that um, pertains to uh, indigenous people and their... Um, Trying and some, how some indigenous people try to like, what's the word? Assimilate. Um, and that was kind of the satire of the original image that inspired the Katrina makeup, which is what this is called, the Calavera Elegante. Um, so there's there's some history to it, but I think that these days it's People do it for fun and celebration. And one thing that I would like to be clear on is that like, this is a, it's a celebration holiday. You know, you're celebrating your, your, your departed and your community and all of that. So it is joyful. It's not how in the U S we think of like a funeral or whatever. So something bright and colorful and celebratory is appropriate for the feeling of the holiday. I should have done that shading before I drew the lines. But when have I thought ahead like that? Hmm? Next time I'm just going to use Sharpie. I don't have to worry about keeping this stupid pencil sharp. Write the name, Sharpie. All right. Stella, were you talking about the um, laughing moon pattern that goes together nicely and has pretty pleats in the back? Because I agree. So the also the skull makeup that I'm doing right now is a historical anomaly for me because if you were going to place this in a time period, it would be early 20th century. So it'd be really cool if I had Edwardian stuff to wear with this and be like the original Calavera Katrina, but I do not. So this is later than my usual, but that's okay. Edwardian is very popular in the costuming world right now. I actually have 
an S bend corset, but I have so many other things that I should make. I've gotten a jankier towel to do this with. What's at the end of January, Adrian? Okay, I can see the cat hair stuck in my face. So someday I would actually really like to do Edwardian with uh, a mind toward recognizing and commemorating Las Adelitas. Um, I'm not sure how I feel about wearing a bandolier full of bullets, given that stuff like that right now is somewhat of a white supremacist dog whistle. So... I'm thinking I might wait a little bit and see what our uh, general national culture is in a few months before I commit to doing that. I mean, because otherwise, without that, iconically, you're kind of just a Edwardian lady. Just like you know, with the, the suffragists, if you're not wearing the sash or carrying a sign, you have a very nice Edwardian outfit, but it's not as recognizable. Um, and the last thing I want to do is to be mistaken for one of those Michiganders. Well, that's a good idea where to replace the bullets with something else. Um, I personally am not uncomfortable with firearms. Um, I was raised in, I was raised in redneck country. Um, and I actually, I own a handgun. Uh, I'm a licensed owner of a firearm. Um, but these days, You really want to out yourself, she said, telling people on YouTube. It lives in a safe. Because I don't need anyone who thinks it's cool to open carry at an election a polling place or... at the state capitol to think that I agree with them. Because I think it means they have a tiny dick. Heard it here first. So Amber asked, how is it going with the Josefina project? Which uh, I talked about a little bit earlier. Uh, it stalled out because I am intimidated by making a session. I'll do it someday, she said.
optimistically. That's the word I was looking for. All that was coming to mind was obsoletely. Okay. I think we're nearing the, the finish line, folks. I'm going to... So, okay, Adrian, because you're uh, invested in my progress on the camisa. I actually have it on my dining room table right now, and I've been working on it. Um, but the other night I was working on it at like 2 a.m. because I couldn't sleep, and I put a gathering thread in the wrong place. And so I stopped because I really shouldn't be sewing after midnight, but my sleep schedule is weird. But the next thing I have to do is cut a big old hole in the middle of it. And I honestly, like, I guess if I mess up, I will just find more fabric and try again. But for some reason, it feels very high stakes to me. Guys, next time, remind me to put eyeliner on when it didn't matter if I smudged things. Just knock my contact off my eyeball. No. It's still in my eyeball. It's just not in my cornea. I need to make sure that the thumbnail of this, once it's done, is like I do not use liquid eyeliner. I have a very mild hand trimmer. And I find that the coal eyeliner is enough more forgiving. Than liquid that I can actually use it. Yes. E. Erbach. That is a good idea. I only will cut the hole big enough for my head to go through. It, it, it really honestly is not high stakes because it's going to be gathered to a band. So like, even if I cut the neck hole huge, it's going to get gathered down. So what really needs to happen is that I need to suck it up and just do it. And if I screw it up, I can still use that linen for like linings and stuff. So Okay. Anyone want to know how old these uh, eyelash curlers are? Probably had it in college. That's old. And let me tell you, I did not graduate recently. So the uh, giant black thing on my nose is visible in my periphery, which is quite distracting.
would also have been really cool if I could have uh, gotten my poop in a group enough to go get like clearance Halloween eyelashes or something. That would have been neat. I barely leave the house these days. I was proud of myself. I went out and I rode my horse in ridiculously bad weather, which we have an indoor arena. So thank goodness for that. But it was windy AF. And so in this basically glorified pole barn, it sounded like a hurricane outside, which can be very unnerving for horses because they are prey animals. And so noises are something to be regarded with caution. But he was a he was a gem. He was a good boy. He's always a good boy. But you have to remember that horses are prey animals. So Well, guys, I don't think I've ever had this many colors of makeup on my face, even in my stage makeup class in college. So this has been very fun. Um, I do wonder. I wonder if I can get this line a little more crisp. Yeah. I might have permanently killed this towel that I'm using here. This is where a liquid would have been very smart. I studied Spanish with a minor in theater in college. So, um, the Spanish was because I started out as not fluent, but a relatively advanced high school Spanish student. And I started out college as a biology major and discovered very quickly that I was very bad at science. Um, but I was auditing a Spanish class and was really enjoying that. So I switched my major over. Theater was because I had, again, done some low-level theater in high school, which... Low level is all that you have available to you when you go to a D-sized school. But it was fun. Um, and I had to take a certain number of credits to graduate anyway. So why not make those theater credits? Because at least then it was fun. Okay, I am happier with that. I'm going to... I just always relied on my friend the angle brush. Angle brush does not do me dirty. My not quite dollar store eyeliner. I actually know several people who 
studied costuming in college that either are still in the industry, which is not doing real great right now. Um, so, you know, fingers crossed for them. But then a lot of people who have moved on because they have discovered the mistreatment of the workforce in theater is too much to be born. Is that a firefly, hopefully? The ferrets are okay. Um, they're very old at this point in their lives, so they're starting to move a little slower, but they were up in Adam a little bit ago, so they're back to sleeping now, and I think... Was Jane moving around? Okay, yeah, they're, they're doing okay. They sleep like 18 hours a day, so they're just doing how ferrets do. I always wondered this. Can you put makeup brushes in the dishwasher? The washing machine? I know we used to put makeup sponges in the washing machine. Oh, crush my saggy skin. I mean, the only thing I can think of is that it, you'd get water inside. I mean, you'd get water inside the ferrule, but if you drain them like that. Oh, I know what I else, else have done the, in, the, in the washing machine is um, I put paint rollers in there. Yes, my dark circles are not noticeable anymore. This is definitely a bonus. Okay. Not bad for my second attempt ever in my life for skull makeup. Next time I would definitely get some like crystals or something. I think that'd be really cool to put like right here. Ooh. All right. So the spider web on the forehead is actually, a, as far as I can tell, a pretty common motif. I unfortunately do not have, I might have some sequins somewhere, but I don't have anything to, to stick them on my face. So um, 
I had no idea I was going to have consistently like nine to 11 people watching this. I was prepared for like two or three and it wasn't going to take that long. And here we are almost two hours later. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm still having a good time. So um, I will definitely be doing more live streams. Um, It is in one of my Patreon tiers. Um, If you are so inclined to throw me a few bucks, I will be doing Patreon live streams, but this has been fun. So um, I will have patron only ones, but I'm, I'm kind of thinking maybe it'd be fun to do these maybe more often, um, but maybe not two hours worth of me doing makeup for the first time since 2008. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I've really enjoyed this. Um, and next time I can, what I would use instead of spirit gum, because it's stinky, I would probably use fake eyelash glue. Um, I was a super nerd in high school and went to the return of the King midnight premiere and wore the whole like elf ears and everything. Um, and I used eyelash glue and liquid latex to stick my ears on because then you could just peel them off, um, instead of having to have spirit gum remover. So that trick seemed to work pretty well then. And it worked for the Renaissance fairs where I went after that with the elf ears. Cause why would you? Um, but yeah, that actually would be fun. I would, I wouldn't mind doing like a redo of the, I did a, an Arwen dress and an Eowyn dress. So that might be something fun to think about for 2021. Let's do some fantasy things, particularly if the virus continues the way it has been like we're not going to be going to events for a while so i might as well play around with some of my fandom me stuff instead of strictly historical um and i have been wanting to do medieval like i just really really like a lot of the aesthetic so that's something to look forward to um but yeah this was fun guys i really appreciate you hanging out with me um maybe we should do like a video chat social like sewing circle sometime or something That'd be cool too. So, all right. I am going to clean up some of my stuff and then I'm going to try and see if we can take some pictures with candles. Um, and that, that'll be the, the wrap up here. So I'm going to get going and we'll take some pictures before I claw this off my face because the makeup actually has stopped itching a little bit, but I can feel like the cat hairs from just in the air of my house starting to stick to me <laughs> so it's it's gonna get itchy before long so oh and I wanted to like a lot of the Katrina makeup that you see you'll have like elaborate headdresses and hairdos and stuff and I knew this was going to be a little simpler because I didn't have enough supplies and time and skill to make it super elaborate but um this simple two braid style is very much something that I saw in the indigenous women in Mexico when we were there. And if you look at images of the indigenous women um, of several regions, the, the two braid hairstyle was really common. And so while the original Katrina image may have been a satire of indigenous women wanting to step out of that culture and into the European, more bougie, colonized culture. I thought that a respectful way of celebrating the holiday without celebrating the colonization of Mexico would be a simple hairstyle like the braids worn by so many of the indigenous women that I met and spent time with and that my dad grew up with and that are still down there making their lives um, despite hundreds of years of Spanish colonization. Um, So that there actually was some thought put into this. Um, I never wear my hair like this. And part of it is because it feels to me like an indigenous hairdo. And also because they flop around a lot. Usually I end up putting them up on my head. But in this case, the the original Calavera Elegante was a satire of people wanting to step out of their indigenous and potentially poverty-stricken culture 
to move into the richer European culture. And so my way of putting a little bit of rebellion in that is to wear a style that to me is very evocative of the indigenous women of Mexico. So there we go. All right. I'm going to take some pictures before I itch myself to death and I'll see you guys next time. Adios.